Now, what are the underpinnings? Um, well, it's probably part of the plasticity story for brain functioning. We know many examples of that, but the wonderful one that gets trotted out most commonly is of the London taxi drivers. And the studies show that the longer they drove their cabs, then in fact uh, their brains changed, particularly uh, the front of the hippocampus was smaller and the posterior region was larger. Um, so this was a nice study because it got around what was cause and antecedent. And so there's something that acts on the neuro, neuronal interconnections. But I think there's a more um, useful model, and that's the Bayesian brain. And the brain operates like a computer, making predictions, operating under uncertainty. And there's strong evidence that we as humans operate in a Bayesian way that our perceptual computations are optimized in judging stimuli in what they all mean. And it's quite nuanced when you look at it in terms of the cortical organization. So the neocortex has six layers of neurons arranged hierarchically. Three of them that are down low handle the here and now sensory inputs and assign weights and observe patterns flow up the hierarchy. The three levels at the top provide the memory-based predictions from the prototypes. And the combination allows recognition. And interestingly, with adjustments. So somebody like John Tiller, who you've seen over decades, beardless, handsome, vigorous, and whatever, now wearing a beard, we still recognize him as John Tiller. <laughs> And we can move on a little bit further. The neocortex has this single basic unit, a cortical column that's repeated over and over again. The basic unit is a pattern recognizer. And there are 500,000 cortical columns, each containing 60,000 neurons. So humans have a capacity store of about 300 million pattern processes, each composed of three parts, input, pattern recognition, and output, involving axons and dendrites, and response to a, a stimulus exceeding the threshold, the pattern recognizer fires, basically saying, in essence, the pattern um, is responsible for, the pattern that I am responsible for is probably present. So a very complicated, sophisticated system. Um, it's not innate. And it's very similar to speech recognition systems, if again we look at um, more prosaic uh, comparators. So in summary, um, for covering the two areas that I have focused on, I'd suggest that clinical reasoning involves an iteration between the discipline-based information, the evidence, plus observational pattern analysis, Secondly, that ideographic pattern analysis is advanced and recalibrate, recalibrated by progressive clinical encounters, and far so than just looking at the evidence. It's akin to a Bayesian process where multiple pieces of information are assembled in a probabilistic manner. It needs thousands of hours of practice and refinement to hone. And in fact, the story may be even more complicated in that as we learn about these Venn and mirror neurons, which are very much responsible for empathy, it may well be that it's a similar process occurring there and where we can actually build up our uh, capacity to empathize with people uh, via a similar process. So questions I think we need to consider is, how relevant is it for your discipline? There will be some disciplines, I imagine, that it will be absolutely minimal. Others where there aren't any laboratory tests, because I think we get lazy if there's always a diagnostic test. 
In psychiatry, I think it's incredibly rich domain because of the absence of those benchmark laboratory tests. And the next issue is, can we predict those who have the capacity to develop and advance those propensities? And if we could, what would be the implications for selecting medical students? But more importantly and more saliently, what are the implications for our training of medical students? Because at the moment we dismiss pattern analysis. We say it's too risky, it's too idiosyncratic, it's just guessing, dangerous, dangerous. And so the issue is, is it teachable? And then the next one is, if so, how? Um, and there have been virtually only one or two people who have attempted to address that question. And as I mentioned before, as these field-specific skills take decades to acquire, we have the paradox that some of our best clinicians feel that they need to retire at the age they've reached their peak. And more worryingly, frequently we start to get worried when we have uh, clinicians, particularly surgeons, operating. And I think that's a totally different issue. That's technical competence. But many senior people, when they reach a certain age, people become suspicious that they may have lost their uh, clinical acumen, when in fact it may, not of necessity of course, be the other way around for a group of probably about 10%. So to conclude, we in medicine are beset with evidence-based guidelines. And they are based on randomized trial data and they give us evidence based on groups. They don't tell us about individuals. And I would suggest just like I've indicated how pattern analysis can assist making a diagnostic decision, I think frequently the choice of a medication or even deciding whether this person is likely to take medication or they have some aversion to drugs, um, uh, even those macro decisions I think can also be relevant to this, this topic. So in my view, pattern analysis is necessary for the practice of good diagnostic medicine, but it's not sufficient. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water. I argue for a synergy, um, but that we simply should not reject pattern analysis on the basis that it's intuitive and it is not of any value in a medical scene that is now dominated by uh, evidence-based guidelines. So that's the talk and I hope there's enough time for questions. Thank you.